Our first speaker for the afternoon session is Dr. Moshe Kam. He's the Robert Quinn Professor and Department, of, Department Head of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Drexel University. He also serves as the Technical Coordinator of the U.S. Department of Defense, funded Project ACIN, the Applied Communications and Information Networking. He's a fellow of the IEEE for contributions to the theory of decision fusion and distributed detection, 2001, and the recipient of the IEEE Third Millennium Medal. He received the National Science Foundation Presidential Young Investigator Award, 1990-1995. He's a licensed professional engineer registered in the state of Pennsylvania. He served the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering as Vice President for Educational Activities as Director of Region 2 in the Eastern USA. Dr. Moshe Kopp. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. It was in the middle of the yeah. That one? Yes, I think so. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon. I'm going to focus on uh, proficiency studies for forensic document examiners, especially, uh, in fact, exclusively today. Uh, in the area of handwriting. And the topics I'd like to discuss is why are we doing that, some background about testing of human forensic document examiners as opposed to machines that try to do that, uh, short highlights of published results, a word about limitations of these tests, ours and of other groups, and some criticism uh, that was levied at them. I want to discuss the scale of opinions. Uh, to present briefly two new sets of results under development, have a short digression about perhaps desired guidelines about proper proficiency tests for forensic science practitioners, and tell you a little bit about what is our research agenda. Now, there, there are enough studies that show that individuals who sit in presentations such as, such as this one tend to tune out after, like, the first few slides. So I decided I'll show you my last slides right now. <laughs> So, so that I, I will give you the bottom line before I go into the details. So uh, assuming infinite amount of time and unlimited number of uh, graduate students and, and, and ample funding, um, the issues that we believe deserve more, um, more study are uh, the opinion scale and especially attempts to validate it. Uh, the impact of cognitive bias is a very interesting question about which we have a little bit in terms of preliminary results, but much more uh, can and should be done. Uh, we and some others started looking about uh, at peer review and collaboration and try to quantify what is the quality of opinions that one gets when you have more than one forensic document examiner looking at a document. Uh, the the Area of simulation and disguise already had some attention, but there are some trends that deserve de 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 deepening uh, of, uh, of, of these studies. I think that the issue of uh, what do U.S. practicing forensic document examiners in particular are doing with handwriting of individuals from other countries, especially individuals uh, who were brought up uh, as a first written language uh, in a language that doesn't use Latin characters, um, Arabic, Russian, Chinese uh, is a topic that uh, we did not pay enough attention to. Because of the fact that uh, proficiency tests have been performed in the last couple of years, um, it would be interesting to do them again. It would be interesting to see if the current generation or group of forensic document examiners um, is better, worse, the same than the groups that were tested 10 or 12 years ago. And I'll touch upon the issue of guidelines uh, as, as we continue uh, this, uh, this talk. So let's start with the objectives. Why, why are we interested in proficiency tests for forensic document examiners? What we are trying to do, not surprisingly, is to assess, to assess how forensic document examiners perform in those tasks that they claim they can perform, and by claim I mean they're willing to go to court to express an opinion about them. So there is a certain level of assurance that these tasks actually can be performed. And for that reason and for some legal reason and Daubert related reasons, we very much are interested in error rates, either error rates or some reasonable bounds 
on the error rates. And typically, there are two types of errors that we try to study, and they are interlinked. What, ha what is the rate at which, or approximation to the probability at which, uh, a forensic document examiner will, dec will declare that a written specimen uh, was created by writer A, given that A did not create the specimen, and what is the rate or approximation of a probability that the written specimen was not created by writer A, but, uh, uh, the, 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 sorry, the document uh, was created by writer A, but the forensic document examiner declared that it was not. Also of interest is the question uh, of what are the rates at which a forensic document examiner will declare inconclusive, uh, given that uh, A did or did not create uh, the specimen. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you in, in, in passing that there is always in my test someone who sits there for all three hours and declares that all the documents that he or she has seen have been inconclusive. <laughs> uh, there, are, there, are such, there are such test takers. Um, we are very interested in comparing performance of forensic document examiners to that of laypersons because of the fact that the question has been asked many times, why do we need these people? Why can't we not just show the document to the jury? And based on what we see, we try to understand to the extent that you can do it from proficiency tests and from interviews after proficiency tests, the source, the conditions, the trends, and the reasoning for errors. And, and we are looking at different kind of specimen, such as extended genuine handwriting, simulated handwriting, and disguised handwriting, signatures, photocopied versus original specimen. And in, in one of our most recent tests, we started looking at original specimen versus photocopied versus documents that are viewed electronically on a screen through the web. So rather than providing a very extensive list of everything that was done, I'd, I'll give you just a quick sample of what exists. Um, and and uh, these, things, these uh, studies, I believe, are accessible and quite well known in the forensic document examiner community. So here are some of our studies. Um, they involved, um, at the beginning, handwritten documents. We either uh, ask forensic document examiners to compare question document to uh, unknown documents or gave them a big pile of documents and, and asked them to uh, take these documents and put them in piles such that all the documents written by the same hand are in one pile and no, docu no, no, docu no uh, one writer ends up with his or her docu documents in more than one pile. Uh, we have done the same for signatures. And on the way, especially because of the fact that there were various conjectures, hypotheses, and guesses by individuals who um, were interested in specific issues. We took some other tests. For instance, at one point, we worked just with laypersons, and we changed the, in the monetary incentives that, they, that we gave them in order to see whether we can dissuade or change their error rates or the probability distribution based on what we pay them. There was at one point a claim that what we did is only... Uh, is only valid for hand-printed documents, and then there was the claim that it's only valid for non-hand-printed documents, depending on the particular trial. Uh, and so it was, it was interesting to go and basically find out whether there is a difference between the, uh, the, this, the, the, the results that we get, the answers that we get from our test takers, the forensic document examiners, uh, and the error rates when we look at hand-printed and non-hand-printed documents. Brian Found and his group have done quite a few uh, studies in the same vein. Most of them are actually on signatures. Uh, they did several tests uh, where they asked um, their test takers to determine based on question and known whether a certain question signature was genuine, and they calculated error rates. They did some comparisons with, with laypersons. Uh, they have also looked at original versus photocopied signatures and calculated error rates uh, uh, about them, and they also did some work about comparing, this was interesting in the context of the last talk before the break, that they compared the visual attention of forensic document examiners and laypersons. Now here is a sample result of what you can find in, in, in our papers, and I'll show you just one sample result from uh, papers of Brian Found's group. Uh, you have here um, 
the truth being looking at the first, at the first line, the question signature, this is from a paper on signatures, the question signature was genuine, the forensic document examiners in the first line, about 86% of the time said that it was genuine, the layperson in 70% of the time said it is genuine. Jumping to the last two columns, first row, when the question signature was genuine in about 7% of the cases, the forensic document examiners made a serious error and said that it is non-genuine, and the laypersons had the same error done 26% of the time. So this is the flavor of these things with the most serious things happening at the corner. And in the second row, we'll just cover the first entry. The question signature was not genuine. The forensic document examiners said that this was genuine in about 0.5% of the time. Uh, and the uh, layperson said that in about 6.5% of the time. Here is just a sample result. There is uh, tables upon tables in, in uh, our papers and in Brian Found Group's paper. This is a, one of, from one of his recent papers on signatures where he was trying to collect several tests together. We are talking here about genuine signature, disguised signatures by the original writer by some mechanism and simulation. And what you can see that he found in this particular case that disguised by the original writer was actually pretty effective in fooling the individuals who were um, examining these, uh, uh, these signatures. So the very general trends, if you look at these papers, and you kind of try to put them together, what we have seen up to the present time was that, um, again, we, we usually calculate the two types of error. They are interrelated because you can be very good in one uh, at the expense of the other. Uh, we see that, um, that, as I said, this guy's increased error rate, and I'll say more about that. Laypersons consistently had higher error rates than forensic document examiners in almost all studies, in almost all, um, all tasks. The results that were obtained by forensic document examiners and those that were obtained by laypersons usually had dif different statistical distributions, which is important. It meant that we get different kinds of results. And monetary incentives to laypersons uh, did not make them good forensic document examiners. And it was even when we paid, and by the way, we, in some cases we paid significant amounts of money and made it like very critical that you do well in order to get your payment, and they simply couldn't do it. So here are a few, uh, few other stipulations that, or areas that, where we, ha we saw some preliminary results that picked our curiosity, but we don't have enough data and more testing is needed. So um, I think that in your jargon, and, and excuse me if I, am, uh, if I am mutilating it a bit, the issue of distinguishing between a class characteristic and individual characteristic when the first written language of the writer is not the first written language of the forensic document examiner. We did some preliminary tests, and, and we think that there is much more there that needs to be looked at. Uh, to what extent does consultation and peer review reduce the forensic document examiner error rates? Our preliminary studies say by a lot. Uh, but there is a need to actually, we may be wrong. I mean, we didn't have enough, enough to, do to come with the appropriate statistical significance. But, we, if, but at least what we have seen anecdotally said a lot. And it also appeared, again, anecdotally. These are things that need more work, and we may found at the end to be wrong. But it appears that forensic document examiners, and I'll show you an example, assuming I am able to fit all this uh, in the allotted time that forensic document examiners are more resistant to some kinds of cognitive bias than laypersons. So uh, some of our studies are still ongoing. Uh, as I said, we don't have enough statistical significance uh, with this business of Arabic, Russian, and Chinese, and also about test about scales, about which I'll, I'll talk in a minute. Uh, in some cases, uh, after internal review, external review, we decided that we need to do more in order to get more significant results, especially in the area of consultation. And in some cases, we just tested the water in order to see uh, what we can do um, in order to introduce cognitive bias. Introducing cognitive bias uh, is a bit problematic. You have to convince, uh, uh, to convince all the committees that allow you to experiment with human beings that you <coughs> are allowed to deceive them slightly, <coughs> covertly. You don't want to overdo it. Uh, you want to do it in a way which is, which is uh, appropriate, measured, and, and the results can be measured. So this, these are not trivial tests to design and administer. 
So here are some limitations of the current test. Some of them are intrinsic. Uh, in our tests, we always knew that we, uh, we and people who worked, Brian found in his group, we know the ground truth because we know how the documents were created. And we do not think that the people who created the documents for us were playing any games. They usually did not know what this thing is for, or they were just writing for us. Um, but what we don't know uh, is if the correct answer is the fifth or the seventh point on the scale. This is we do not know. We know if, it's, we know if it was written by this person or not, but we don't know where it should fall. So what we do is we always coarsen the resolution. We reduce the resolution. And we basically do our error rates based on some decision as to what does it mean to say yes, what does it mean to say no, and what does it mean to, say in to stay in between. And this is intrinsic. This is something that we, we cannot do that much about. There is also the logistical question. There is no question that the conditions that, uh, uh, that uh, prevail in our tests limit the ability of the forensic document examiners to show their capabilities in full. There are time constraints. There are space. Uh, and some desired comparisons are not possible. In many cases, I would have liked, when I have a room with 60 forensic document examiners who have been kind enough to allow me to do testing, I would have liked all of them to see exactly the same document, original. And of course, I cannot do that unless you know we are willing to wait three weeks. So, uh, so there are some in intrinsic um, limitations, and we would have loved to be able to like install ourselves for a week in different labs and torture our colleagues for that period with all kinds of tests. But of course, it's not practical. We need to, we need to find ways to do it um, in 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 in, in short-term sessions. Now, of course, in addition to the to the the regular, the, what, what I would say is, is natural uh, limitations. They are, uh, we hear many criticisms, uh, some of them justified, some of them not. Uh, of course, we hear that we are not testing FDEs uh, to the full capacity. Uh, we hear that we are not doing the right comparisons. And uh, usually the right comparison are such that would require um, conditions that are just infeasible. Uh, we always hear that these are not the right statistical tests. And that, in fact, every statistical test that we bring has always some, some, some objection to it, uh, that we are not looking at the right forensic document examiners and that we are not looking at the right laypersons. The, our laypersons are too educated or are too uneducated, uh, too regional or too dispersed. But, but, again, there is a limit to how you can build the ideal groups. I just, I just want to mention something in passing here. And that is that there is a lot of literature about what people who don't like our tests and Brian Found tests and other tests and other work that was done in the area, uh, such as the work of some individuals who are in this room, there, there, there is a lot of literature about what people do not like about them. There is very little literature about best practices. There is no standard of, of um, proficiency testing in forensics, not just in and there may be some benefit to try to think about it because of the fact that right now the literature is completely lopsided. And it's, and it's very easy to do. In fact, most of the criticism, I agree with them. You know, there is always a limitation. But the question is to what extent you can balance between the conditions and the desired outcomes and what are best practices and what we should consider communally as acceptable and as or unacceptable. Let's talk about the scale of opinions. So um, the scale of opinion, I think, came into being officially as a standard approximately 1995 or so. And we were interested in, in and, and at the time, uh, there were quite a few other scales that people loved and worked with for many years. But there was a sense in the community that, that, uh, that you could get very easily if you spoke to, to, to sufficiently many forensic document examiners that it's a very good thing that everybody will, work, will sing out of the same hymnal, that everybody will use the same scale. And at approximately 1998, 1999, we started um, working on att attempting to validate the scale of opinion. This was our first attempt. And there are several ways to do that. The most famous one is Kronbach's alpha, which is a coefficient of internal consistency. It, direct, it, it indirectly indicates the degree to which a set of items measure a single latent construct, and that is what you really want. And there is 
fractal analysis and cluster analysis and several other techniques. And based on information that we gathered in interview and then in some testing, and about 2000, 2001, we looked at the ASTM E1658, the nine-point scale. And it was pretty clear at the end of this that this was premature. It was premature because of the fact that there were multiple interpretations and quite sharp disagreements about the meaning of terms. At the time, there was a strong desire on one hand to use a single scale and on, and not, on the other hand to continue to do what I've done before. So it was not uncommon for us to talk to someone who said, of course, I'm using the nine-point scale, but I'm only using five of them. Uh, so, and again, it's a matter of legacy, and it's, under, it's understandable. So when we try to do the test that will lead us to the calculation of Kornbach's alpha at the time, uh, we were not able to get to the, min, the, the magic minimum value that is, that is considered valid, um, and even by dropping some, and we came to the conclusion that one needs to come back and, uh, and do it again when there is more agreement in the community. Now, I've seen, and, I, and maybe this is not right what I put on this slide. It's not the SwigDoc has now suggested, but I saw a SwigDoc document where a five-point scale was suggested. I would suggest that it may not be a bad idea. I mean, a change of a scale is a very, very painful surgery. It's painful surgery to the people who work in the field to the, and the, to the, to the customers of their, of their work. I would humbly suggest that if there is serious th thinking about something like that, that we... Uh, try to uh, maybe go back and, and, and try to test now that the nine-point scale have been, has been around for a couple of years and see its validity and see what happens when you drop some. And incidentally, I understand that there is a desire to be symmetric, though it's not necessarily have to be so. In the couple of minutes that I have, I'd like to show you some new result in development, some, some initial data that we collected on two, two issues. One is to address simulation and one is to I try to inject cognitive bias. So this is work that is more mature, the addressing simulation, and what we try to do is to uh, ask forensic document examiners and laypersons to identify or exclude writers of naturally written uh, documents, but some of the question document uh, was simulated. In other words, we have asked someone to sit down and try to simulate in one way or another. Um, there was a list of ways that we asked them to do that to simulate the handwriting of the genuine writer. And what we have done was to provide forensic document examiners and laypersons with a set of documents which we labeled known and were all written gen by, the, by the same person and question documents, some of which were simulated. And we were interested in finding the error rates. We were interested in finding out whether forensic document examiners are better or worse or the same as laypersons in doing this work. And in this particular case, we have used, as laypersons, for the first time, we have used a, a mock jury. We have actually uh, hired the company that hires individuals in the greater Philadelphia area for lawyers who try to test their, their, uh, their ideas on juries, and they have done this for us. Um, I'll mention that there, there were short documents and long documents for a reason that's coming up. Yeah, I, I'm keeping tab of the time. 22 minutes. So, um, what we um, what we have seen, I'll just jump to the end. We have we have seen what you will not be very surprised to find out. Essentially, these you can look at either one of these tables describing what the error or the error rates of the forensic document examiners. You can see that in one one type of error they didn't make at all, and one of them they, they make about 10 10 percent. The laypersons were totally different and dramatically worse. And not surprisingly, statistically, the two groups were different. Um, then, we, then we tried with the same basic test, we tried to see if we can introduce some cognitive bias and see what happens. So the first attempt that we made was basically to try to um, quantify the effect of contest on the accuracy and conclusions. And uh, what we tried to do first is to... Well, in general, we try to inject bias deliberately and to detect the effect of it, if there was any, and then to try to characterize it. And the first thing that we tried to do was to try to create the impression that um, the simulated texts were include misspellings. In other words, we tried to 
build it in such a way that people who sit in our test will be more likely to find, mis at the beginning, misspelled documents that are simulated and then assume that misspelling is a sign of simulation. Uh, and interestingly enough, we failed in both for laypersons and question document examining, and we, this did not work. In other words, the, statistically, we got the same results from the groups whether or not we tried, we tried this trick. And the way that we have done that, we put the groups in two different rooms. One of them did the usual thing, and the other one has the, has the poison test. So this having been failed, we tried again. And what we tried to do in the second case was to try to create a, an impression, sadly, the documents that are short are more likely to be simulated than documents that are long. Uh, by, by telling the appropriate story, which we tested uh, uh, on both laypersons and some forensic document examiners in another setting, we, we were pretty clear that we have told the right story. And this actually, again, without getting into too many results now that my time is almost up, uh, we, were we, would we were not able to bias the forensic document examiners, but we were able to bias the laypersons. They actually went for it. Finally, there was one thing that we started doing which was interested, and interesting, and I'll just tell, tell it to you in words rather than showing you additional graphs. What we tried to do was to um, provide un unexpected document distribution. Forensic document examiners have been taking our tests for a long time. They kind of know that some of the results are that he wrote it, some of them he didn't write it. So we put them in three rooms, in three groups. We gave our usual test to one group, and in one room we gave a test where it was all matches. And in the other room we gave a test where it was all non-matches. And we were wondering what will happen. So I'll tell you the bottom line. The, the, it was interesting. The error rates did not go up. It was the forensic document examiners who sat in the rooms with the, uh, or, or with the biased sample, but um, their inconclusive rates went up significantly, and they started slowing down. <laughs> uh, very interesting. So in other words, it did affect. It, it, it increased the inconclusive rate dramatically, but it did not increase the serious errors. So that was interesting to see. Again, this is work uh, which is ongoing. And with this, I'll put again my first and last slide. And if I have um, a minute or so for questions, I'll, or if, even more than that, then I'll appreciate having them. I have four minutes. <laughs> Ask away, please. I have a question over here. Yes. Um, on the... Uh, Cognitive bias issue. Some of the other disciplines, uh, latent prints and uh, some in DNA, ETL drawers done some studies in there. And um, the contextual bias piece of introducing a scenario of this person confessed or this was previously determined to be a match uh, and then representing the question in known. Have you approached it in that? There's question? no way I'll be successful doing that. I'll tell you why. The forensic document examiners are waiting for me to do this. <laughs> They will catch me. I mean, just try that, and you'll see the smiles as I'm trying to, to, tell, to tell my telltale stories. No, this has to be done much more intelligently and without, tr with, without, without, without trying to insult anybody who's intelligent by all kinds of stories. This will not work. Uh, this is a very difficult task, to create the right test, to do it, to do it correctly, not to offend anybody, and to, to, get, you know, to get meaningful statistical results. Additional questions? Uh, Dr. Kim, uh, without going into great detail, uh, the last point you made, the idea that that caused examiners to become more inconclusive, um, I hope you're here tomorrow because my talk, which is kind of out of sequence in the overall scheme of things as it turns out because I changed the topic, actually touches on that. Um, but. What we found with some of our stuff is that it really is a reflection of uncertainty. So by putting in this weird uh, structure, this construct, it would have struck those examiners unquestionably as a, a strange situation, elevating their uncertainty about the whole thing. And I think that's probably a big part of why they were expressing more inconclusives. You'll agree with me, however, that if we had the machine that does just comparison of patterns, it wouldn't care. It wouldn't care. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah.
one more comment about that. I don't think that's the sort of thing you typically find in casework, however. Whereas this being a, a test of a sort, uh, you know, a, a research project, uh, we're aware of, of more tricks that may be played, not by you, of course, but, <laughs> but by someone. Whereas in a, in a test, uh, in a case situation, that typically doesn't happen in that way. On the other hand, the bias could be imparted by your hiring an attorney to come tell us that there was uh, something going on, and, yes. and uh, we would believe them, maybe, or I'm not sure, believe I'm, them, I'm whatever. I'm absolutely sure you not, would yeah, believe them. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> any, any other questions? Thank you very much, then. Thank you, Dr.